good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here. It's such a full hall. I'm delighted that the audience uh, is, is as large as it is, and uh, I look forward to some questions later. My topic is the science and practice of resilience thinking. <clears throat> the word resilience is now really common, and it's used in different ways, and often casually with no real meaning. And because of this, it could lose its value. And uh, that would be a serious loss, because the rapid and the significant changes that are happening all over the world now require a well-structured resilience approach to cope with them. And the key feature of resilience is that there are limits to how much any system, whether it's an ecosystem, a society, a business, a city, a person, your bodies are complex systems that have limits to their resilience. How any of those can change before they can no longer recover? How much change? So the simplest definition of resilience is the ability to cope with shocks and then to keep functioning in much the same kind of way. A more detailed definition, more scientific, that captures how it works is the capacity to absorb a disturbance and then reorganize so as to retain essentially the same function, the same structure, and to the same feedbacks that keep the system working the same way. In other words, to have the same identity. Resilience does not mean just staying the same. It involves changing, reorganizing in response to a disturbance in such a way that the system can keep functioning in the same kind of way. But there are limits to how much a system can change or be disturbed and then still recover. And those limits we call thresholds or tipping points in social science. And they occur between alternate states that the system can be in. And once a threshold is crossed, it's very difficult, sometimes it's impossible, to cross back again into the original state. And these threshold effects are common in all kinds of systems, as I pointed out a little earlier. This is an example from the Great Barrier Reef off Australia of coral reefs, and coral reefs can exist in these two states. That's the state that people love, with the abundant, rich coral species, but they can turn into this, dominated by algae, called filamentous, but they're just big algae. And the reason behind that is that fish that eat algae are being overfished in many areas, big herbivorous fish. And the other thing is that nutrients from agriculture on the land, nitrogen, phosphorus, are flowing in. And they favor the growth of algae. They do not favor the corals. And if you take out too many fish and you put nutrients in, the system can suddenly flip. It doesn't gradually go. It goes from this to that. And once like that, it's very difficult to get it back into that state. These are two lakes in Wisconsin conducted by my colleague Steve Carpenter, it was an experiment. And they were both clean, fresh lakes like that. And he then started adding nutrients in here, phosphorus, nitrogen. And gradually as he added the nutrients, the water kept looking like that. And then the next little bit of nutrients that then went in, it suddenly flipped to look like that. It wasn't a gradual increase in the amount of it. It went from that to that very suddenly. This is some of my own work from rangelands in Australia, and that's one state that the rangeland can be in, and that's the one that all the ranchers want, is lots of grass for their cattle, and that's the other state, which is a dense, shrubby state with almost no grass there at all. This state is maintained by having occasional fires, and I'll give the reason behind that now, is that shrubs, they outcompete grass for soil water. So the more shrubs there are, the more the water the shrubs get and the less goes to the grass. But fire kills shrubs, but it doesn't kill grass. And every few years in a normal rangeland, there's enough grass that builds up with the fuel load, so there's a fire and it kills a lot of the shrubs and it stays in the grassy state. 
But if shrubs increase, the amount of grass decreases. And there's a threshold level of shrubs where beyond that, not enough grass can accumulate for a fire that'll kill shrubs. And once the rangeland crosses that threshold from the grassy to the shrub state, the amount of shrubs has to be reduced to much lower levels before the rangeland can cross back into the grassy state. Now, I promise you this is the only bit of scientific stuff I'm going to foist on you, but um, this is how I need to explain it to you. This is the amount of grass in the system, and that's the amount of shrubs increasing. And the picture that I showed earlier, that what the range managers and ranchers want, is somewhere in there. Very few shrubs and lots and lots of grass. But as the shrubs increase, the amount of grass begins to decline. And when it gets to about that much grass, this much shrubs, it drops suddenly into that shrubby state. And once it stays there, it's very difficult. Now, if you start getting rid of the shrubs somehow, and you go back to there, it doesn't come back at that point into the grassy. You've got to bring it all the way back to about there. And there are various reasons for this, this development of root systems in the shrubs versus the grasses. I won't go into all of that. But there are good biological reasons, ecological, why you have to bring it all the way back there. Then it goes up to that state. So this tells us that between this amount and that amount of shrubs, that rangeland can be in two different states. It can be in the grassy one, or it can be in the shrubby one. And that is the threshold between these two states. If the amount of grass and shrubs is there, it'll tend to go up to the grassy state. If the amount of grass and shrubs is there, it'll go back down to the shrubby state. And that's, that's, that's a change in the direction that the system moves. It's a change in feedbacks in the system. That's what we began to learn about the dynamics, the thresholds. Now you can take that same picture and apply it to all kinds of systems. In a business, that same kind of threshold effect occurs between the increasing amount of debt to income and the business viability. So I take that same diagram, but instead of shrubs and grass, I put the viability of a business. And the business viability depends on the debt to income. And as the debt to income ratio gets bigger and bigger, the viability, and then it drops. Now, if you want the business to become viable again, you've got to drop that debt to income ratio far below the point where it collapsed for various good economic reasons, which economists here will understand. So once again, that business can be in two states, depending on the debt to income ratio, and there's a threshold between them. It's not a gradual change. It's a sudden shift at that point. <clears throat> now, virtually all systems have at least one and often several thresholds. Environmental systems, social systems, economic, transport systems, power supply systems, many others. And it cannot be assumed that we know all the imp important thresholds. We can't assume that. Many of them we get surprised by when they happen. This looming food, water, energy nexus is worrying many organizations, uh, corporate, international corporations, the United Nations, governments. It really talks about the amount of food is getting less and the demand for it more. The amount of energy, the cost is getting higher and energy is a problem. The amount of water, as Professor Falkenmark will tell us later, is becoming more and more limiting and worrying and problematic. And as these three become more of a problem, they're intensifying to become what they call this looming nexus. Now, that's bad enough when you look at just the three of them. But if you look at the links and the feedbacks in that whole system, it's much more complicated because Climate change is affecting energy, it's affecting food, it's affecting the amount of water. Antibiotic resistance is rising all over the world through misuse of antibiotics, and new diseases are coming in. Refugees, war, terrorism, economic shocks, ones we haven't even thought about yet. All of these affect each of these, and it becomes a very complex system. In that system alone, 
there are 42 connections. Now, it's impossible to think that you can figure out the consequences of any particular change in that system. The number of pathways and connections that can go through are just too complex, so you wouldn't do it. And the only way then that you can deal with that whole food, water, energy nexus and the factors affecting it is to build the capacity of the whole system to withstand any kind of shock. And that's what we call building general resilience. And the attributes of a system that confer general resilience, there's quite a lot of them. And I want to just deal with a couple and I'll give the risk a very quick one. The first one is diversity. So the more diverse a system is, the more resilient. And there are two kinds of diversity. One is functional. I'll think about ecosystems. In ecosystems, you have trees and shrubs and deep-rooted and shallow-rooted. You've got um, insects. You've got pollinators that pollinate the plants and so on. Each of those are different functional groups, and they make the functional diversity that makes the system work. And then we have what we call response diversity. And I'll give you an example of that. If an ecosystem, one really important function in any ecosystem is to be able to fix nitrogen, because nitrogen doesn't occur on its own in the soil. It's got to be fixed from the atmosphere. Nitrogen is fixed by legume species. So if an ecosystem has one species of legume, as long as nothing happens to that species, this, the function of nitrogen fixation will continue. But if something knocks out that species, kills it, a particular disease, a particular level of frost or fire, and that species is lost, the whole function of nitrogen fixation is lost. But if that ecosystem has 10 different legume species, they're all performing the same function. They're doing the same thing, but in different ways, and they have different responses to disturbance, to disease or temperature or whatever it might be. So if some big sudden disturbance hits that ecosystem, it'll knock out some of the legume species, but at least some will remain. So the function of nitrogen fixation is resilient. One of the big dangers in the world today, where people are always trying to streamline and become more efficient and get rid of redundancies, is to say, well, we only need the best legume, let's get rid of the other nine. That's what often happens in business when they're looking at efficiency. What you're doing is you're actually losing resilience. Probe the boundaries is the next one. Variability, I talk about it. Children who are never allowed to play in dirt grow up with compromised immune systems and then they suffer from allergies later in life. The only way for a child to be resilient in the environment it lives is to expose the child to that environment. Not to cross the boundaries so that it dies, but to let them grow up exposed to that environment. A forest that is never burned eventually loses the tree species that are able to cope with fire through competition with others. So when a fire does come, the whole forest is lost. The only way to make a forest resilient to fire is to burn it every now and then. So trying to keep a system absolutely constant and protect it from any kind of disturbance reduces its resilience. Now, there are many others, and I don't have time to go through them all. Uh, reserves, having lots of different reserves, whether they're financial or water supplies in the soil or whatever, reserves give you it. Modularity, that means how connected the system is. A system that's fully connected with all of its parts, if something bad gets into that system, like a disease or a bad idea, it can spread right through the whole system. If it's not connected enough, then the system can't make use of the connections. It doesn't have the support that other parts can give it. So both of those are not resilient. There's some intermediate level of connectedness which confers the maximum amount of resilience. It's hard to find that, but that's a fact. If we look at the others very quickly, having tight feedbacks, we call it response time, as opposed to long delays before you can respond. 
and that's happening in many organizations. Social capital has been identified, the amount of what they call resources and capital, and three things keep cropping up in research. Trust, the amount of trust there is in a society. The networks, the social networks there are, and leadership. Those three keep coming up as the components of social capital. Innovation and learning confers resilience. And this is versus subsidies to continue doing the same thing that's not working, but promoting novelty and innovation and learning. Having adaptive and distributed overlapping governance, the Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom got her Nobel Prize for working on that, and she showed that the kinds where you make a decision in a, in a region or a country needs to change the level. Sometimes it needs to be at the national level. Sometimes it needs to be at the local level. But where the decision is made needs to depend on the circumstances. If it's fixed, it's not resilient. So you need adaptive and overlapping governance. Now put these two in, uh, in italics because we, I wrote a book with a friend some time ago and at the end of the book, we challenged readers to, um, to come back to us with ideas that they thought would add to general resilience, their attributes. And we got lots of replies, but they fell into basically these two categories. One, and they're both social, one was fairness and equity. The more fair a system is deemed to be, the more equity there is amongst it, the more resilient that system is. And the other one was humility, being humble and not thinking you know everything. I'll leave you to think about those two. Well, those are the attributes that we and then there will be others, but this is where we're at at the moment in our understanding, and they confer them. Now, I want to go through some important points that emphasize what resilience is and what it is not, because this is often something that, that I come across. So to begin with, resilience per se, as such, is not good or bad. You can have very resilient bad systems in our view. A desertified landscape, <laughs> A salinized landscape, an evil dictatorship, can be very, very resilient. So it doesn't mean resilience is good. Resilience is a property of a system. That's the first point. It is not the ability to bounce back. You often see they talk about the ability to bounce back to what it was. It's the ability to change and adapt. So you use the disturbance to reorganize so that you can handle that better that adaptation. So you change within limits. The third one is it is not about not changing. That's the examples I gave about the children in the forest. You don't prevent disturbance. Keeping a system constant reduces its resilience. You cannot understand or manage the resilience of a system at one scale. Now, that's, the tendency is for people to say the problem I'm dealing with is at the scale, the regional scale or whatever. But often the solution and the reasons why it is there are occurring at finer scales, at maybe the farms within a region or at the national scale. And it's the cross-scale connections that are often missed and that are crucial to managing and understanding resilience. So that cross-scale thing, always think, of what scale is here, what are the embedded scales, and what are the scales above. Most losses in resilience, when you lose it, are the consequence of focused, narrowly focused optimization. These are these efficiency drives that I talk about. And this relates to the next point, which is maintaining and building resilience comes at a cost. Accepting some inefficiencies and several ways of doing the same thing, as I've described, is all too often called redundancies, but in fact, it's response diversity. In applying resilience, the task is not about choosing where to go, some particular optimal state or future. It's about choosing where not to go. There is a developing area of science now, you can Google it if you want, called guided self-organization. And what it says is that avoiding thresholds and enabling a system to work, you don't try and fix it in some way that you think is perfect and keep it moving. You allow it to self-organize 
but you do the, you guide that self-organization. You prevent it going across thresholds into really bad or unwanted states, but you enable and allow self-organization. In much of the world today, existing systems are failing, and the need is not to make them more resilient. The need is to transform them into a different kind of system. I did a workshop some time ago with um, the Global Environment Fund and UNEP looking at sub-Saharan African agriculture. And one of the aims to beforehand was to say, we want to make the agricultural system there more resilient. But in fact, as pointed out by some people there, they didn't want that. The systems had failed. Making them more resilient was like digging the hole deeper. They need to find a different kind of way of using the land than the agricultural systems there were. So the need is for transformation then into something else. So that's a part of the overall resilience idea. And what determines it? What is transformability? What's the capacity to transform consist of? And three things have been identified. And the first one is obvious. It's getting past the state of denial. It's accepting reality that what you're doing is no longer working. And that's a major problem. That's the denial of so many corporations and governments that climate change isn't actually happening. And it's that state of denial you've got to get past before you can think of transforming. And then it's identifying options. Some of them exist, some need to be created and experimented with, but what kind of options are there to change? And to get that, you need support. And that's generally from higher scales, from international or the national government or whatever. And, but the support must be helped to change rather than help not to change, to keep doing the same thing. In Australia, for example, we have droughts quite often, and the farmers get into a really bad state, some of the ranching areas, so they get drought relief and is paid out. And as soon as the drought's over, they go back to doing the same thing. So they get help not to change. But if, in fact, the government said, look, we'll give you money and help you, but this is tied to the fact that you now change the kind of farming that you're doing, and that's a big problem to overcome. So the big question, I think, that faces much of the world today is where is there a need to build resilience and where is there a need for transformational change? And it applies at all scales in much of the world if you think about the part of the world that you know. Okay, so I come now to where and how and when to intervene in a system to manage resilience. How do you know where to start and get going? And a useful guide for this is, is the metaphor of what's called the adaptive cycle. And there are different phases of this adaptive cycle. The first one is a growth phase. So a new business that starts out is very agile and it's got free use of resources and it can do any kind of thing open to ideas. A new ecosystem can take in new species and it grows, there's free nutrients all around. But over time, the business becomes more consolidated, it becomes more rigid, it's more difficult to make decisions. The ecosystem becomes more consolidated. Most of the matter is tied up in wood or litter, there's no free nutrients and so forth. And that's called this conservation phase. And as that goes on and on, the system becomes more and more brittle, more and more non-resilient to some kind of external shock. And then it'll collapse. It'll go in through this collapse phase into a release phase where nutrients flow out the system, the business fails, the money flows out, and that goes very quickly into a reorganization phase which can either mean a complete collapse or it goes through another of these cycles. Now, the important thing is that we call this, um, from the growth to the conservation, the front loop, and the point about it is that it's slow and it's predictable, and, we can, and that's what we really understand most about. We know very little about this release of chaotic back loop because it's fast and it's unpredictable. And it's chaotic in that point. You can't predict it at all. And what's important is that this part here and this part there are self-organizing. The outside part of the world can stay exactly constant, and that will happen anyway. 
Nothing causes that change from outside. These changes that from there and those to there are self-organizing within the system. But that trigger going from this to that is an external shock of some kind. Now, I haven't got time, unfortunately, to expand on that with the examples, but it's worth thinking about that adaptive cycle in all sorts of different contexts. And the point that I want to make here is this collapse that triggers that shift from the conservation to the reorganization is often a crisis opportunity for making a difficult change. At any other time, you could not make that change. But during that collapse phase, you can make that change. It's an opportunity. And so being ready and prepared to make use of crises is an important part of the ability to transform. Okay, I'll leave you then with four resilience messages. Embrace change and uncertainty. Build systems that will be safe when they fail. Don't try to build fail-safe systems. Learn how to ride the system, finding adaptive pathways into the future, the guided self-organization idea. And lastly, be ready for opportunities that crises provide. Thank you.